everybody and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. Uh, this is a fortnightly event put on by skeptical groups all across the UK and even beyond the UK, all joined together to uh, to help bring a little slice of skepticism into your homes uh, through our, our Skeptics in the Pub Online adventure. We've been doing this all the way through the pandemic, uh, but these days uh, we're actually able to go back into the pub. So if you enjoy this, if this is your first time here, you enjoyed this conversation, I would urge you to check out uh, your local Skeptics in the Pub. There's almost certainly one not too far from where you are, and they're almost certainly going back into having real person, uh, in-person events in the local pub, having speakers along and uh, and having some really interesting experiences. So I'll feel free to check all of that out, and I'm sure you'll be able to find details of that all over the internet and social media. Um, this is our fortnightly event. Uh, we, we're going to come to our speakers for this evening uh, just shortly. Um, but in uh, in two weeks' time, we'll have another one of these talks uh, right here on Twitch. Uh, and that's going to be with uh, Deborah Hyde, who's the former editor of The Skeptic magazine and uh, a folklorist and writer. And she's going to be talking about the life and death of Marjorie Jordamain, who was uh, a, a witch uh, who, was, uh, who was killed for uh, being accused of being a witch. So that's going to be a really interesting talk uh, right here. Um, as we're going to be talking and having an interview and a conversation for the rest of the evening, feel free to join in the chat on Twitch. Uh, so you can go right there. You can have a little chat amongst yourselves. Absolutely fine. It's not like in a pub where we ask you to be quiet and listen. You can chat and listen at the same time, such as the joys of the internet. Um, but if you do see something that you're not comfortable with, if you see something where someone is doing stuff that they are uh, doing and saying stuff that we don't think is appropriate, just let one of the mods know. You'll see the mods popping up from time to time in the chat uh, and they'll be able to take care of things. They're excellent, our mods. Um, because we're going to be doing this interview throughout the course of uh, the evening, you may want to put your questions to the speakers. The best place to do that isn't in Twitch. It's at uh, at our, our Q&A system uh, on Slido. And the way to get to that is SITP uh, dot online forward slash ask. And that link will be going in the chat as we go too. So that's all of the stuff you need to be aware of. You'll see some other interesting links and relevant links in the chat as we go as well. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, tonight's speakers. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the the speakers tonight are the veterans of more than 600 podcasts of their Cognitive Distance podcast and a load more of their of their Citation Needed uh, podcast. They've now uh, written and released their own book, The Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit, which I've got right here. So please uh, go wild in the chat for, uh, for your guests this evening, Tom Curry and Cecil Cicerello. Yay! Yay! Hello, Hello, guys. We're going to cheer for ourselves. That's okay. Hey, you cheer for yourselves. Yeah. Be, be assured, the chat was definitely cheering. I could hear oh, the was, clap the emojis. Chat, there were the some, some deafening. praise emojis. There was, there was all sorts of stuff going on Absolutely. there. A yeah. deafening silence is, <laughs> is what is what I heard. For, yeah, I, I, you know what I don't, we don't have in the States that we need, Cecil, is we need a pub system. Like, you guys have yeah. this, like, whole thing where there's, like, a neighborhood pub that yeah. people, like, sort of, like, belong oh. to. And it's, like, this, like hub of social activity. We've got nothing like that. Yeah. We got, you got like a local bar that you go to maybe <laughs> to get drunk. A bar is not a pub. Though. No, no it's we don't have different. an equivalent. We need that. We don't have that. We when we that. were, when we were in the UK, I remember going and people would ask, I, other people would say, where's your pub? <laughs> they were like, what? Like, like it's like your fucking library or right, something. Yeah, like it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, what, what the pub do you belong to? Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we need well, that. We gotta fix that. Well, I'm very glad to be able to bring a pub to you, at least virtually, <laughs> yeah, uh, virtually virtual this evening. Pub. Welcome to the Skeptics yeah. uh, in, in the pub. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel uh, well. And so, guys, you've written a book, The Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit. Uh, you've written that book. It's right here. So I guess a good place to start, <laughs> seeing as we're going to be talking about this book. Um, what is your Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit? In a nutshell, you know, so people don't have to go <laughs> and buy the book or anything like that. If we if we tell them they're just like the Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit is available for purchase at Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the idea the idea behind the book comes from, like you said, six hundred podcasts. So we've been podcasting for a long time, and we started to notice more and more and more that a lot of the bullshit that we cover, whether it is alternative medicine, whether it is a paranormal or a supernatural thing whether it is conspiracy based, there seems to be something that links it together. Hmm. And we started thinking about what that thing was. What is it that links all these things together? And you know, without looking like the guy standing in front of that big board with all the push pins in it and all the yarn everywhere, without looking like that guy, we tried to think about it a little bit. And what we came up with was that the people who believe it are the people who they, they, they wind up having these very emotional attachments to the bullshit. 
And one of the things that we do really well is we fool ourselves and we motivate ourselves into believing these things. And what we did was we looked through all of these and noticed that that was really a thing that ring, rung true about all these different types of bullshit. And so we decided to talk about them in depth. Mm. And then we also spent a lot of time in the book talking about the harm that that bullshit brings. Because it's one thing to understand that something isn't true in sort of a like a 30,000 foot level and it doesn't really matter. But if something's not true and it's hurting other people, it's a real important thing to get right. And so that's why we wanted to talk about, we spent a lot of time in the book yeah. discussing the harms that these mm. things cause and even things that a lot of people might have passed off years ago as something that isn't very harmful, we really dug down to try to show that there's harm in a lot of this stuff. And it really can it really can be detrimental, not just to us individually, but also to the sort of the information ecosystem, if you will. Yeah, there, there's an just to add to that a little, there's an erosive quality to bullshit. Um, bullshit is sort of acidic, you know, it 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 erodes. So what if it's if it's Bigfoot? you might have a laugh about it. You know, if it's like, you know, Loch Ness Monster, you might have a little bit of a laugh about it. But, you know, if you believe in that nonsense, then there is a, it, it, it must also be true that you are willing to believe things without a demand for evidence. Hmm. And so that door is open. And whether that door is open wide or whether that door is open a crack, it's dangerous to keep that door open because there are people looking and kicking at doors constantly looking for small openings, looking to wedge them open further to sell you shit you don't need, to take your money, to involve you in, I don't know, insurrections against the American <laughs> government. <laughs> Wacky yeah. stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah. So it, 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 we've got we've to do some work to recognize the erosive nature of bullshit. Yeah, it's. I think in a lot of ways, these various different pseudosciences, it, it feels like a decade ago when you know you guys were starting out on cognitive dissonance and we'd, we'd only just started Merse Merseyside Skeptics uh, at the time, we might have sort of thought about each one of these different types of pseudoscience as, as unique and discreet. You know, you could believe that 9-11 was an inside job, but it didn't necessarily mean that you thought right. cancer, the cancer cure was being hidden by the pharmaceutical companies or that the moon landing was faked or that you shouldn't trust doctors when they tell you to do X particular thing. But it feels like I don't know whether you'd agree with this, whether the, the, the barriers between different pseudosciences have eroded in the subsequent decade or were the barriers never there and we just weren't good at spotting. Uh, spotting know, no, it the has algorithm. eroded. It's yeah. the algorithm. That's yeah. the thing yep. that links everything together nowadays. You know, your QAnon people can find each other uh, yep. and can find all that other crazy stuff that they believe, let's say, flat earth theory. They might mm. be turned on to that because the YouTube algorithm turned them on to it. So they might have never really known about it beforehand. But the, the, the real problem and, you know, the real, real, real issue with it is that it's what it's doing is it's linking it through the technology that we have yes. links it together. Yep. And that's really super dangerous. Yeah, it, I think it used to be the case 10 years ago or 15 years ago that um, bullshit kind of naturally existed in these self-contained silos for the most part, yeah. mm -hmm. because that information didn't travel well and it didn't do the work of community building. And so, you know, if you believed in some nonsensical bullshit and then you went to work, the chances of you finding somebody at your work who also believed the same brand and flavor of yeah, bullshit yeah. that you like was relatively low. And so you were kind of siloed and that kept the sort of borders around your bullshit to be fairly secure. Yeah. And so it didn't spread as quickly. I mean, like it spread, but it didn't spread in this mm. sort of hyper viralistic way that things move now. But the technology is such that, I mean, and, and they'll acknowledge it, right? And we all acknowledge it. Um, there is a work that these social platforms do to try to create communities. And they try, and they're very good at, creating communities around niche interests. Mm. That's fine if it's knitting. That's fine if it's, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever your fucking hobbies are, a, a video game, a sports thing, whatever, it's fine. But when the interest is, nonsense, bullshit, conspiracy theories. Now, all of a sudden that community building it, what does it do? It creates communities of incels mm. who find other incels, right? And then they commit acts of terrorism. It builds communities of flat earthers who, you know, then say, well, if this is true, then what else necessarily follows? Yeah. If you start yeah. from bad <laughs> premises, then you're not hamstrung or reined in 
in your conclusion yeah. drawing. Yeah. And I think we're seeing an acceleration of that in a way that we, we really need to get our minds around because the, the technology is built to accelerate that process. It will get bigger and faster. It, we are not going to pull the, the reins in on that. Mm. Elon Musk essentially said it out loud yesterday, right? I'm not even kidding. Like he essentially said out loud that he is a free speech absolutist and he's going to have, you know, one of the greatest disseminators of misinformation in American history back on Twitter, Twitter just yeah. as soon as he can possibly gain control of the big unbanning machine. Yeah. So we're, we're in for it. We're in for it. It's, it's, it's getting worse. It's a sort of it's a it's an irony in a way that um, back before the ease at which we can find people who agree with us, uh, you're absolutely right that you might you might have believed that John F. Kennedy was assassinated by the U.S. government, but the majority of people that you'd stumble across in your life wouldn't believe that, and so you'd just be left with that one belief. Whereas now the ability to find other people who think that JFK was assassinated actually makes you more likely to believe in other things. I think there's a right. really weird irony there that it, when, when you're when you can't find anyone who is, agrees with you, you just hold on to that one belief. But the moment you start yeah. finding people who agree with you, you get this kind of, I think it's a group polarization is the, the the term for it. Whereas you get a lot of people together who all agree with the same premise, and they'll start to add in other premises because the the they have fewer people around them to sense check them, fewer people who have oppositional yeah. voices, and so you end up getting more and more polarized because your your normal your center is completely out of whack and pulled in one direction. Uh, I, you know, if, if I work at, at the, uh, you know, local post office or warehouse, and I believe in that, in the, in the Kennedy assassination nonsense, and I want to sit at lunch with my friends at lunch, and I start telling them about that, the likelihood that they're going to believe me is low. And like, to your point, they're going to push back on that, right? Mm. Like, Tom, you're crazy. That doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to have to think about that and gut check that. And then maybe I'm not going to bring it up as much, but we're in a place now where I just wouldn't bring that topic up to my friends in real life because they're going to push back on me, but I'll 100% bring that to these other spaces. And then I'll have an opportunity to have that message reinforced, but more than reinforced amplified. Mm. And so we, we not only don't have the breaks, but we also have this machine of amplification, which makes the voices seem louder. If I find a thousand people in real life that agree with me, the likelihood that I'm right is fairly high. If I find a thousand people online that agree with me, the likelihood that I'm right is no higher, right? Because mm. a thousand people online, the pool that I'm drawing from is just so much more massive. So, but we're, we're bad at assessing numbers. We're bad at assessing, you know, yeah. how important sure. that is. Yeah, yeah. So, oh my God, I got a thousand people that are also horrible misogynist incels that I'm connected to. This must be a more mainstream view. Yeah, right, right because we're not checked because we're not bringing that to our personal relationships anymore either. So again, mm -hmm. the bullshit has a, it, it, it has a virality to it now that it didn't 10, 15 yeah, years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and and what we also see, because um, you have got, uh, you end up immersed in communities focused around this one particular thing, it's not only that uh, you start to add in other ideas, but it allows people to start uh, expanding those ideas, building them and going further, further mm -hmm. up. And this is why we see people who, you know, will one day believe in this particular conspiracy theory and then have to start looking for, well, who's the perpetrator of that conspiracy theory and what else have they done? And you yeah. know, I, I always talk about it in terms of the flat earth. The people who believe the world is flat also believe that the truth about the round uh, the flat earth is being hidden from the public and therefore you right. need someone to be hiding that truth and you need a motivation for that. And you yeah. almost always get back to shadowy uh, extra governmental organizations. And if you do that for long enough, you're going to start ascribing racial identities to them and before yes. you know, you're denying yes. the Holocaust. So that yeah. kind of escalation is there when people um, aren't given the tools or given the, the motivation to sense check what they're taking in and to, to look for oppositional ideas. Yeah, for sure. And one of the things, too, is that bullshit builds off each other. That's a great point, Marsh. It, what happens, I mean, just think about think about spirits, right? Let's let's go to something else. Let's mm. go away from conspiracy for a minute. Let's talk about spirits of the paranormal. How many people in their life believe in spirits because they were brought up religious, right? Mm. That bullshit builds on each other, right? So you, you're religious, you grow up religious. Well, now you believe in bullshit. Now you believe in uh, in spirits. You also believe in devils. You also believe in angels. You also, there's a million yeah. other little <laughs> tiny things of the paranormal now that you kind of believe. So when you see the Long Island medium peddling her bullshit, right? 
it all kind of makes sense because you were brought up on this sort of same level of bullshit, but it also also adds on. It's like a stack of bullshit on top of each right. other that she's constantly feeding off. She can mm. just rifle through that file drawer and pull out any kind of bullshit in there. And you're going to believe it because it's all sort of stacked on top of each other. Yeah, there, there's a it, I, I was thinking while you were talking, both of you guys, that what what we're doing in some ways is um, we're now engaged in this new project where we're all creating a new fan fiction narrative um, where we're redefining the world one piece at a time. And and it's not, if it's flat earth and it's the long Island medium, we can, you can write a story that incorporates all of those elements. Mm. And so QAnon is a great example. Yes, QAnon yes. started off relatively narrow and it has expanded to include just about every conspiratorial nonsensical idea possible. Oh, it 5G towers great. Reptile people come on in. Yep. A cabal of democratic satan worshipers sounds good. Yeah. It's it all you have to do is just continue to write a broader story that brings in that so none of the bullshit is ever exclusive. Yeah. It's all yeah. mutually inclusive, inclusive. Yeah. and all you have to do is be adept enough at writing that fan fiction, at writing that new narrative. And it will be, it's this like weird open arms community of just complete nonsense, <laughs> complete <laughs> nonsense. And it, what, what strikes me about it is some of this nonsense was very, that we've talked about, it's very American centric that's now been exported. Yeah, mm. there, are, there are MAGA groups and movements MAGA's make America great again. And I am seeing MAGA slogans outside of the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unironically. Yeah, yeah. And you're I, mean, like, I was at a, a QAnon how? conference just last weekend uh, in Birmingham, UK, and there are Trump signs there. There are U.S. flags. It's and when it comes to QAnon, I think you're absolutely right that uh, this idea of, of, of being able to incorporate everything in even beyond the source material. What's what's really interesting to me about QAnon is adrenochrome, the idea that um, the elites all feed <laughs> on the adrenaline produced by babies when they're in states of terror. So they have to cause terror yeah. to a baby and then She's harvest the adrenochrome. Like yeah. Adrenochrome was never mentioned by the posts from Q. It was never in there at all. But it's one of the core beliefs, core tenets of the whole idea of QAnon. It's the whole Pizzagate, everything like that was all yeah. really focused on Adrenocom. It was never mentioned by Q. That's an invention and an addition by the um, the the collaborate the, the sort of the the creative yeah. collaborators yes. that yes. The, the community produces. And how yeah. much of this do you think is um, is because when there aren't any wrong answers? everything counts you, when you're not <laughs> yeah. tethered to some foundational principles yeah. that are that are based in reality because you're accepting a lack of evidence you're allowing things through the lack of evidence then you kind of have no gates no no checks yeah. And, yeah. and no barriers anymore well and also when you want to demonize another side right the opposite mm -hmm. side nothing's out of bounds and so the the deeper the darker the lie the better it is for you because it, it depicts your opposition as demonic and horrible and literally inhuman. And mm. so, you know, the, 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 the piece of QAnon you're yep. talking about is called Frazzle Drip. <laughs> and what yeah. that comes yeah, from. I can't even. What, I know, it's it's the stupidest I, thing. Just, in the world. Frazzle Drip sounds like a place in Fraggle Rock. Like it's, it's a weird, a, yes. very strong. But anyway, so yeah, it's like a Muppet. It's where the Muppet, right? it's like a Muppet it's, water fountain. It's crazy. Mm. <laughs> it's, like, it's where the Muppets yeah, exactly. go good and get yeah. hydrated. Oh, let's yeah. head over to the Frazzle oh, Drip. Go like, okay. Drip. But so the, the, the whole concept comes from a, a, a file supposedly found on Anthony Weiner's computer when they collected it, when they arrested him from for sexting with a minor or something, mm -hmm. they collected his computer. And on that computer was supposedly a file that had images of Huma Huna Amadine. I don't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her. I, don't know. Remember, she was, I know what you're talking about. Was, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know either. how to pronounce her name, but her last name is Abedin, I believe. And she was uh, like Hillary Clinton's aide. And mm. so they were like cutting the face off a baby and like, like, All this like crazy, harvesting its blood or whatever. Nonsense. And it was supposedly on there. And this was spread by so many people. We, we covered this when it, when it first happened. Mm. Tom and I laughed until we cried. It was the dumbest thing we had ever. We thought heard. this was super niche. Yeah. Like, 
I crazy stuff. Recently, I want to say within the last year, they asked whether or not this was a thing to like the broad public in a poll. And it was in the double digits past 20, I think, believed mm. in the United States, believed that this is a real thing, that the pedophile rings and the harvesting of children, that's a real thing. And this isn't just like a small group of people. This is a wide swath of America believes, you know, 20 percent of America is a lot of America. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, they believe it. They believe yeah. it. So it's it's a. That's it, it. It started. It started out as a joke. What we thought was a joke. Yeah, it felt like a troll. But like, mm. we're also at a place where there's it's an there it's impossible to meaningfully distinguish what trolling means anymore. What where because those lines aren't actually terribly um, clear and and to be in many ways they're not important. Um, it's like the birds aren't real, guy. Right. Yeah. That's a clear troll. But there are people then who have signed up unironically to this. It's it's the crop circle problem. We talked about this before. It's a crop mm. circle problem. It's like, hey, these guys said they did it, and here's how they did it, and it was all a hoax, and that doesn't change doesn't anything. Stop people from believing it because people are have become, and the the book talks about this quite a bit. People have become emotionally and personally invested. Their narrative um, about how they see the world has become invested in this in this worldview and these ideas. And so to uproot those things is is very, very challenging. Um, and to your point, Marsh, before about, you know, if your epistemology does not require rigor, then you are going to be open to, you know, why, how in the world am I going to have a Q epistemology that is closed, mm. right? There is no central text. There is no dogmatic, you know, uh, holy book of Q. It's all being invented on the fly. And so, and you don't have an epistemology which is exclusive and requires certain evidential standards. And so when the next crazy thing pops up, you know, like the adrenochrome thing, it doesn't matter if it popped up from Q. I think Q has stopped tweeting. If oh, I'm yeah, not mistaken, ago, yeah. Q stopped yeah, no, posting. It stopped. It stopped. And it literally makes no difference. It it's like the crop circle guy saying, hey guys, it was you know, two strings and a board and like, it doesn't matter. It yeah, literally yeah. doesn't make any difference. I, I think that whole thing about uh, if, if you, if your epistemology is untethered, um, I think that, that barrier, that, 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 uh, that check that we need to put in place is because we all make decisions and accept information first of, first and foremost based on whether it fits the worldview that we have, how we want to see the world, how we feel about yeah. the world. We, we Everything passes through our feelings before it hits our head. Um, and for a lot of the cases, you, know, you, you never fact check the thing that you agree with. You only fact check the thing you disagree right, with. Right. Yeah, and absolutely. it's, it's a, a, an intellectual perversion to force yourself to fact check the thing that you agree with. So how yeah. do we how do we get past that when this is so ingrained in who we are as people that this can is I how we all one, operate? Can, let's go. Let's roll back to that in one second. I want to add one more thing mm. that talks about rigor, because we there's also the illusion of rigor. Right. Yeah. So what will happen is, is these these like, for instance, turn on Destination America or the History Channel and watch one of those shows that shows you ancient aliens or shows you Bigfoot or shows you uh, the the one that where they, they show all the different. There's like a, it's like a, a, a paranormal collage of yeah. all different kinds. Yeah. Of I'm stuff. scared of the dark. Yeah, shows. Exactly. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. but there's there's one that's like it's very much it very much feels like a sort of documentary where the people have impressive titles and they have a lower third under them and they're dressed in a, in a, in a suit and they're having this conversation and they're approached as experts in a field that might not even be a real field, right? <laughs> right. When they're like a spiritologist yeah. isn't a thing, right? That's not a thing, but somebody has that title underneath their name and they, they bring this illusion of rigor that it's sort of, this is, you know, they'll have technology that looks like it's impressive, like a ghost box when that is just like a piece of garbage with a circuit board in it and it doesn't mean anything. And so they bring this illusion of rigor to make it seem like they have the backing of science or the yeah. backing mm. of several fact checks and there's nothing Thing. And they will talk about things in a way to make it seem like it's a real thing. So they won't say things like they won't make have a conversation about whether or not Bigfoot is. They have a conversation about how Bigfoot acts as if the first part of that question it's of whether or not. Yeah, it's a presupposition. Yeah. Bigfoot exists. And here's Therefore, what he eats. Yeah. <laughs> this is what he sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so that's what, right. But there's there's always that piece. And so there's an illusion of rigor there that that. 
the democratization of technology has made very easy for so many people. And the big networks, of course, latch onto this too because they want ad revenue. They want ad dollars. Mm. So they're going to show like that guy with the big hair who's going to be like aliens. They want that guy on the TV all the time. Yeah, I think on that illusion of rigor, I think that's a really, really good point. I mean, it's some of the things that we see often when it comes to alternative medicine, for example, which is another topic yeah. that you cover yeah. quite extensively in the book. Um, it, it's easy to say that there's no evidence that such and such works, but actually it's not true. Homeopathy, for example, you could say there's no evidence homeopathy works. That isn't true. There are thousands of studies that show homeopathy works. <laughs> there are thousands of peer-reviewed studies in peer-reviewed journals that show homeopathy works. It's just they're all garbage. They're all flawed in one way. They're all, um, yeah. you know, the the, yeah. the biases uh, are in there. The conflict of interest are in there. They won't be blinded, etc. And so you have to look at the quality of the evidence to understand that. But if you're not used to look at the quality evidence, if you haven't got the time, the inclination, the training, and yeah. loads of people haven't, you've got your life to go about. You're not there to, you know, learn how to read every single different type of scientific study. It's going to have the illusion of rigor. Yeah. And so well, it's the same with the TV show. Yeah. It looks like rigor because that guy has a title. That woman has a title. She looks really authoritative. That's how you package up authority to me. And I'm yep. just trying to go about my life and I'm trusting these things. So yeah. the whole system, it feels, there's there's a lot of shortcuts to using the trappings of rigor without any of the content. So what... Well, uh, you, what yeah. Sorry, go on, Tom. You, you, no, as I say, I just, I just want to latch on to something because I think it's important we talk about this in the book too, is you, you, you've, there's a problem that I think of as the problem of primary sources, and I don't know what it would really be called, but you know, the the thing is that the scientific evidence is available if you are trained to read and understand the language of science. Mm. And you know, there, there's, I was just listening to the SGU book, um, not to plug their book, but I was just listening to that today or yesterday. And one of the things that um, Stephen Novella was was relating was, you know. There's a guy, and I forgot his name, but he's a guy. He's a Nobel laureate in chemistry, and he's deeply wrong about some really important shit in biology. Mm. And just because you are trained in chemistry doesn't make you an expert in biology, right? We are we are um, fooling ourselves because of the internet. I believe we are fooling ourselves into believing that we are all trained to read primary source material. That we all, a regular guy like me who's got a degree in English literature has any business picking up primary sources in molecular biology and pretending that I understand the language that that's written in when effectively that material is written in a language I am not trained to understand. It may as well be French, a language I don't speak. I will likely, likely if I read that, get loads of things wrong because I will read terms that have colloquial definitions colloquially rather than understanding their strict scientific definitions. Yeah. I will not understand what confidence intervals are and mean and should be. I won't understand how to look for, like what you said, like how, how will I as a lay person understand that a, a study is biased or the sample size is inaccurate? I, and we are told all the time, do your research, fact check. But the reality is that we are not equipped to go to the primary sources. And we need to understand that we do not have the language, the training, and often the intellectual rigor, if we're being honest mm -hmm. about who we are, to move into the primary sources for every subject possible that you want to understand. So there has to be other, epistemologically, you have to have other options to understand the world in a rigorous and honest way that gets you closer to reality, recognizing you'll likely make mistakes. Mm -hmm. The internet has fooled us with the democratization of information into believing that all of us can just plug some search terms into Google and then pick up some, you know, journal article on ivermectin, read through it and be like, case closed. I've got my degree in English literature and I totally understand what I just read. <laughs> when yeah. in fact, if I'm being honest about myself, I don't, I shouldn't. And that's not how I should go about sourcing information reliably. Yeah. That's a tough thing to do because it requires a certain amount of real humility. And I all think, the thing I think too, that humility is, sorry, go on, Cecil. Yeah. I was just going to say another thing too, Marsh, is that we have to then rely on a secondary source. Yes. And sometimes those secondary sources are biased. Yep. And so what they will do is they will, they will present an argument. This happened to us very recently. We were talking on our show about the male birth control pill. And yeah. the articles that Tom and I sourced for this um, that we that were that we were turned on to 
all spun it as such that men were too wimpy to do this sort of thing. And then they dropped out. And that was how it was sourced to us. Mm. But when other people sent us other articles, those other articles said no. In fact, the board said no. And these side effects were much more drastic than these other articles let on. So it's so tough because we are not scientists. We are not researchers. We're just dudes reading NPR who we hope is a good source. And it's coming back with a very biased approach. Yep. So it's tough to try to even sometimes source uh, to suss out that bias. Mm. So this is an interesting point because I, I totally agree. And I, and I think it's it's that idea that the more time you spend around misinformation and pseudoscience and, and the effects of misinformation and the pseudoscience, um, I find the more aware I get of my own limitations and the, where, the more aware I try to be of my shortcomings and the things that I can't uh, I can't do. Because like Tom, I have an English literature degree. I, I too am not going to be de delving deep into the science. I have core horse on Skeptics with a K for de delving deep into the science. That's uh, that's not my my area. But I want to ask you guys, so you've been you've been doing cognitive distance since 2011. Um, do you find that you're less um, certain or less immediately certain uh, or less immediately sure of your position now than you used to be? Or, and do you find that your your style of skepticism, your style of response to these type of stories and reaction type of stories has changed over that uh, over that decade and a bit? It absolutely has yeah. changed because I think we're a lot more empathetic now than when we first started. When we first started, we were a lot younger and a lot, I think, more uh, let's laugh at people. Let's laugh yeah, at people. Very cocksure. And uh, and I think now after seeing harm in it for so long, you become empathetic and recognize that these that there's a lot of people that are being duped and being harmed and being hurt. And uh, and you also start to become sickened with the stories that never stop. They're the same thing over and mm -hmm. over and over again, where you're mm -hmm. constantly seeing, uh, you know, there's a there's a. A uh, pedophile ring that they keep talking about, but they never talk about the pa Catholic Church. You know what I mean? And you're just like, you're like, okay, but but really, this is a this is a sickening story that has been happening the entire time we've been doing the show, and it never stops. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we I think we we empathetically have become a lot more sensitive to those things, and have stopped. Um, I think being as <clears throat> brash as we were about certain topics. Absolutely. But I also think too, like you know, we've never said that we were a primary source for anything. And yeah. I want to I want to I, I wanna make sure that we, we, we when we first started, we're like we we collect show notes and we put those show notes together with everything that we source for this show. And if you think there's something wrong there, please read the source material. And then if we got it wrong, tell us we got it wrong. And we are, our show is constant corrections because yeah. we want to be corrected. <laughs> and we're not the smartest guys in the world. And we're not the you know, we're not going to we're, we're going to make mistakes. But we want to we want to make sure that that mistake process is open and honest and always there. And mm. if it's not, then you should be you should definitely be like, whoa, what's going on? These people are hiding their mistakes. They're deleting their tweets. They're doing this stuff. We don't want to do that. We want to be we want to own our mistakes every time we make them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and well, that's something that you and you and Tom have both now said in, in both the last kind of uh, points you're making, this idea of recognizing your own mistakes, recognizing uh, your own fallibility. So is that one of the red flags you would say? I know we're going to come to the red flags and the, the checks uh, that are in the book. But is that one of the red flags is looking for people who refuse to accept that they've made mistakes, refuse to ex <laughs> accept their own uh, their own flaws? Um, I always find it's it's the folk who uh spend all spend a, a great deal of time saying well i wasn't wrong for these reasons the double yeah. down the yeah. especially you see it from people who've who are the type of person who's an expert in one field speaking far outside of their field because they're so used to being right because they normally talk about things that they're an expert right. in that the second they step outside of that and get uh, and get things wrong their instinct isn't to say oh shit i fucked up there and I'm, i've got this all wrong it's to say well yeah. actually i'm right for these reasons and and actually here's all of this laundry list of things that prove that i was right all along and you double down and just try and defend yourself yeah i i, I think so and i think the the biggest cuz there there are people who are very sure and they're sure because they're genuinely experts in a topic right mm -hmm. and you, we, we should differentiate those. And one of the ways that I always differentiate them is if I'm engaged, I'll, I'll look and say like, do they appear to have a reliable process that they've used that they can elucidate and articulate meaningfully to me? So, you know, and, and I've done this, I don't do a lot of online stuff anymore, but I, I have occasionally pushed back on people said, if, if that's true, I'm willing to think about that, but I need you to articulate your process as to how you arrived at your conclusion. And mm -hmm. what I find is that um, very few people who have wildly outlandish conclusions can articulate meaningfully their process as to how they got to that, 
you know, to that end answer. Mm. So I think some amount of like aggressive surety is certainly a red flag. But if you are absolutely of certain of something for which you have never clearly interrogated your process yourself, then that's a hundred percent. That's the, to me, that's the blinking red light. Like that's <laughs> yeah. like, that's every red flag all at the same, same time. time. It's yeah. like, if, if you've never asked 20 good questions in your own mind about how you arrived at your own conclusion, you haven't thought about this. Mm-hmm. You don't have, you don't have a rational process. Yeah. And, and I, one of the things that all, for, for, for viewers who aren't aware, I do a show called Be Reasonable, where I talk to people who've got... I thought um, it was Be Reasonably Skeptical. Be Reasonably Skeptical. Can we get the name, the name changed? Right? Depending on the actual <laughs> listener, or just one of you two guys. But the name does vary. Um, but I talk to people who've, uh, who've got beliefs that are outside of the mainstream. And that's one of the, the, the signs is uh, I try to... to, to, to encourage them to interrogate how they arrive at conclusions. And so many of the people who hold the most fringe beliefs are so resistant to that process of self-examination. Right. Partly maybe because and you could speculate it's just because it's it's on some level they know that the foundations aren't solid. That if you start picking at the threads of how you got there, you'll start to realize that your reasons for believing something aren't what you assume them to be. They're actually something much deeper than that, something much more visceral, something much more emotional, because we're all emotionally driven. There's yeah, no such yes, thing yeah. as, as, uh, as an unemotional decision. Absolutely. And that's an important point, right, is that is that I, I hope the book gets across the idea, because I don't know if you remember this, Marsh. This is a long time ago, right? But there was sort of this schism that happened in skepticism and in atheism where there was this like hard rational group of people who were like mm. emotions are stupid and and facts and logic and blah, blah, blah. And they kind of like were this real force for a while. And I just think that they never really thought about how they think about stuff and how they encounter the world. And we're all susceptible to this. Right. Mm. The reason why we wrote the book isn't because we think that skeptics are somehow immune to this no. stuff. Uh-uh. We wrote this book because we want you to recognize that you are just as susceptible to it as everybody else out there. And if you just know it a little bit, it might help. It might it might be the one thing that pushes you over that can help you prevent yourself from believing in something because of a long history behind it or believing in something because you've never you've you've always had a biased approach in researching. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do this thing. I am very forgetful. Um, in general. And I'm particularly forgetful in the morning. Morning is not my time to shine. So if I have to remember something and I know I'm going to have to remember to bring something with me, I take my car keys and I put them right on top of the thing that I'm going to have to remember the next day because I cannot leave. I have to sabotage myself. I have to booby (laughs) trap my own life, right? Because otherwise I know I will make a mistake. And the book, the end of the book really is a series of suggestions that recognize that all of us are fallible, myself, Cecil, everyone, we are all fallible. So how do we put our keys on top of the shit we're supposed to bring with us? Mm. How do we put pieces in place as difficult as it might be to put some of those in place to reduce the amount of forgetting, reduce the amount of mistakes we make, recognizing very fully that we'll still make mistakes. We will still make them. But if we put our keys on top of our briefcase, we're unlikely to leave the house without our laptop. So we, you got to do some of that stuff because we have to recognize, like, look, there are faults that are inherent in who I am because I am made of meat yeah. and I can't escape the meat. And that's OK. It's great. I love being made of meat, but I've got to do some things to make sure that I have sort of booby trapped my own life so that I don't fall into into those same traps as, as that I'm trying to avoid. Yeah, yeah. That was a it's, terrible metaphor. My God, did I believe yeah, that metaphor? No, I think, yeah, holy yeah, cow. No, it's, it's belabored, Tom. <laughs> Terribly it's, belabored. I think it's good. It's, it's, I often uh, think <laughs> we, we can look at the people, especially as skeptics and lots of the people who will be watching uh, right now will sort of define ourselves or describe ourselves at least as, uh, as skeptics. And I often find that skeptics can sometimes... Um, be be remiss in applying that to themselves, to saying like, yeah, all these other people who believe in all this unusual right, stuff, they're right, wrong about right. stuff, but I'm not like that. And we do have to fully hold in mind that we are just as prone to all these things because these are human biases, human flaws, human uh, misfirings in the brain and shortcuts. And it's that idea when the the, the schism that you talk about, Cecil, it, it seemed for, to me like there was a lot of people at the time who, who took skeptic as 
I'm a skeptic now. Give me something to be right about. You know, I am yes, a skeptic. Yes. I'm therefore right now. Point me the subject and yes, I'll tell you the right yes, answer. Yes. When really we should be using the label skeptic to say, is to say, I'm a skeptic, which means I'm going to try to be skeptical as much of the time as possible. Yes. I'm going to fail, but I'll fail a lot less because I'm trying than if I didn't try yeah. in, the, in the first yeah. place. Um, yeah, there was a there was a fight against emotions too. I mean, a real big fight against yeah. that idea, right? Like, oh, this person's, you know, you're thinking emotionally. You're thinking it's like we all do, man. That's how we all think. We all we right. all have this gut reaction, and then we we try to figure it out. And so, like, like we all think like that. But I think that there was a real push back then, especially to fight against that mm -hmm. emotion. And mm -hmm. I don't want the book to come across as like this way to be like I'm Beep, dismantling bop, things yeah. with facts and logic that's mm. not what it is but it is it is definitely like like tom says some some, some side of warning system to let you yeah. know that you can fall into this definitely pay attention well before we uh, before we come to the q and think let's it'd be good to to wrap up with that warning system so do you mind if i take you through the 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 various bits of advice you have in the last section we can talk about please those do sort of right ahead. Yeah. so this is in your uh, your advice on how to check things you say first of all inform yourself intentionally never accidentally do you want to explain what you mean by that Sure. So intentionally versus accidentally, try not to get your your news from Facebook, right? Like if you're scrolling through Facebook, I, I'm, recently there was a thing. So I don't know if you know, but Roe versus Wade is in peril here. It's which mm. is our abortion abortion protections for women in the United States is in peril, and I've been seeing tons of memes that are memes about it that have yeah. some sort of factual information about it that may be true or not true, but there's no source, there's nothing there. So if I were to inform myself with just memes, how sure can I be that that is a proper legal decision or something that they're quoting? I can't be sure. And so to try to find those things in a different place that has sources and that you can dig yeah. upon and that you can, that is robust enough so that you can keep following that down to the source is very important. Don't inform yourself with memes, I think is another way to say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, uh, I think that's good advice. Uh, the next one you had, uh, which I think flows from that in terms of that sources uh, idea, vet your sources for trustworthiness. How do you do that when you may not be in the best place to know what constitutes a trustworthy source? What, what guides can we have for that? Yeah, so we we talk about that in the book. So there's there's a variety of things that you can do. Um, so when you're looking at source, so first of all, to come back to the never accidentally, so you should avoid consuming any information that you didn't seek out to consume. So your act of of consuming information should always be an intentional act that you've set aside a, an opportunity or a time to do. So if I'm going to say read the daily news today. I should have my sources from which I know that the news is most likely to be trusted. And I can look at that and say, okay, what is the business model for this news? Um, is it, do they appear to have a, a revenue model that makes some sense? If they don't, that's suspect, right? Cause I can mm. type any old thing on a WordPress site and gussy it up and make it look neat, but I have no revenue model attached to that. So a revenue model in a consumerist culture will tell you whether or not there is some likelihood of accountability, financial accountability attached to the veracity of claims. That's one mm. way that you look at stuff. Um, another way is to look specifically at what advertisers are available on a site. Is it a bunch of nonsensical bullshit? Is, is, is it full of pop-up ads for, you know, goat weed, horny goat weed boner pills? For real, if it's full of nonsense, that tells you who the target audience is. And the target audience for bullshit is more bullshit. So you should have some recognition there. You should be able to look and see who wrote every article. Every mm -hmm. article should be, the source should be labeled. It should be a journalist that you can look up and identify. You should be able to know what their credentials are for any anything that was written. If you read something and it doesn't tell you who wrote it, why are you reading that? That is a bad thing for you to be reading. Yeah. So we, we outline in the book a series of things that you really can look at that are very practical yeah. and specific that give you a way to vet a source before you begin relying on and reading that source. Mm -hmm. um, next up, you had uh, Don't Confuse News with Opinion, which I think is uh, a really interesting one. And I, I want to check, <laughs> is that also true of listeners who come to you guys for news? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, if yes. You we think we're a news think, show? <laughs> That's the thing is, right? People will think you're a news show, but we are an opinion show. 
And we've always been an opinion show. Yeah. We look at the news and then we have an opinion about that news. And and that's a different thing than finding news or researching news yes. or being a journalist and asking other people questions and following down a lead. We do none of that. We do none of it. We none only of it. like the guy at the New York Times that we subscribe to, he does that. And then we look at his work and we decide whether or not we think it's worth talking about. And then we talk about the ramifications of what he's talking about. But we don't ever really talk about the we don't ever do yeah. any of the work that that mm. person is. we're like five kevin bacons exactly. away from the yeah, truth we're like super far away from that <laughs> yeah and we never we would never claim to do it and we always provide links to our work rather and so yes you should absolutely pay attention to that and there's some people who don't and some people who try to blur that line and that's a real dangerous thing yeah um, and on a similar note, uh, one of your piece of advice uh, was watch for incendiary language. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not on opinion shows. <laughs> Not on opinion shows. Yeah, I, you know, if you if you are reading, if you're supposedly looking at a news source and that news source appears to have really emotionally evocative language, it is unlikely to be a quality news source emotionally evocative language is for opinion pieces and editorials and maybe analysis, all of which are different than your news itself, than the factual news itself that you should be gathering. So if you're looking at a source and right off the bat, the fucking headline on the front page is full of emotionally evocative language. Um, you should be very, very skeptical that that is a high quality source. Mm. It's one of the things, actually, that uh, as an editor of uh, a skeptical magazine, I spend my time encouraging writers to take out. If, if in any kind of emotionally evocative language or incendiary language makes it into an article, you take it out because it, it it removes some of the credibility of what you're writing. Yeah, it makes absolutely. it so that it's really clear that what you're trying to do then is to manipulate someone into a certain conclusion rather than 100%. evidence it based on uh, on what you've actually got there. And we want to do that on our opinion show, not in our newspaper. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, we'll definitely allow you to do that. I think that's a really good place to to wrap up for the first half uh, the, the the viewers at home have got lots of uh, useful uh, useful tips on how to go ahead and uh, and read the news and uh, and pay attention to the world around them uh, and in the second half we're going to be having a Q&A where we're going to put your questions to Tom and Cecil uh, but before that we're going to have like a 15 minute break so that will bring us back at 8pm remember you can go to sitp.online forward slash ask if you want to ask a question that we'll be putting to Tom and Cecil in the second half and you can go to sitp.online forward slash donate if you like what we're doing and you want to throw a couple of quid into the pot uh, to keep this kind of thing going and keep us doing the type of stuff that we do. Uh, so we will now go for a 15 minute break and we'll see you at 8 p.m. UK time. to skeptics in the pub online uh, and please in the chat give a huge welcome back to tom and cecil your guests for this evening uh, as we're going to put the, your questions Yay. to these two gents right here um Yay. i hope everybody in the audience has been able to you know recharge their drinks uh, i think you uh, guys we're gonna are uh, we're going to recharge ours now so we're going to open up an american bottle of woodford reserve kentucky bourbon and well, i hope gonna, that are, wait, hold I'm on. A, I'm a, i'll be quiet I'm a, yep. There we oh, go. That's a good okay. noise. Okay. That's a good Perfect. noise. Here we go. Right. I'm okay. pour there you go, buddy. Yep. And then Tom's going to pour himself the some. The only bourbon. thing Kentucky has ever produced yeah. that's I mean, worth really, a damn. Yeah. Other than oppression. It's is, really, they're really good at that, too. Is so. bourbon. Cheers. There we go. There you go. Cheers. Cheers buddy. to you guys. Cheers to all the people far away <laughs> in another cheers land. Cheers to the pub. Cheers to I will all cheers to you Man. with my, my cup of tea. I'm just going for a cup of tea this evening, but there you go. Okay, so we've got lots of uh, lots of good questions. Remember, everybody, you can ask more questions uh, if you go to sitp.online forward slash ask. Um, but we've had a, a question from a couple of people, which is all about the book. They're excited to get the book. Yeah. They're interested in the book. They're not all that keen on the publisher, well, the, the seller of the book at Amazon. Yeah. So is there a non-Amazon version of the book so, or what's the, what's the Amazon status in terms of the book? So let me just explain. It, it's so difficult as an individual in the world nowadays to try to get a book self-published and then printed and sent out to people uh, in a way that doesn't absorb all of your time as someone who also works another job. So we had to choose an option that was 
that would that would be able to facilitate that without us spending a lot of time yeah, on it. It had to be print and ship it on had demand. To be both. We, had so to. We, we went with Amazon because it was the easiest to do. And the people who we found on Upwork worked well with Amazon. So it just worked out that way. So if you're looking to run your eyes over this book, be that electronically through Kindle or through the other uh, through through like both a physical hard copy of a hard cover or a paperbacker. The only way you're going to be able to do that is through Amazon. We're also though the, 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 the sort of shining, the, the silver lining here is that we self-produced our own audiobook. And since our show is a podcast and most people are used to hearing our voices and in particular, Tom's voice is the one that voices most of this. Marsh plays a, a, a small role in the beginning as he reads his piece. And I read my piece at the beginning as well. But Tom reads the rest of the book and uh, and the book is available on our website, dissonancepod.com. So you can go there and download it. And then it's one of those one of those files that you just like have forever. And then you can import it to your iTunes or whatever. It's an MP3 download. So you can essentially download it and just put it in all of your play players and then just play it. It's an eight hour long book and it's cheaper than most of the books that you would find on Audible. It's 15 bucks. So it's it's a relatively inexpensive book. Uh, I think you have to pay sales tax. So it's more than that. I'm just saying like the price we put it at, but I think there's sales tax as well. So don't quote me on that. But that book is available to anybody. And that is that has nothing to do with Amazon. And we understand and empathize with the people who yeah. don't like to use <laughs> Amazon. So we recognize that. But there was just no good way for us to do it um, uh, personally. Without, yeah. yeah. No. So what you're saying is you just love Jeff Bezos so much you couldn't pass any Jeff, other way. Jeff, please take me on your next space ride. We, we, wanted, we wanted to pay for on, another phallic rocket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also on the subject of the book, we've got Andy Wilson, host of Incredulous, who says... Oh, Andy um, Wilson! Is that yeah. Is that... Is oh, that yeah. still happening? Oh, yeah, no? fourth episode's coming out <laughs> next year. <laughs> we Who love knows? you, Andy. We love you. Marsh made us say that. Marsh made us say that. <laughs> That's uh, ridiculous. Andy, He's got to have seven, eight episodes now. Uh, Andy does ask that. A bunch of skeptics have bought or will buy the book. What's your hopes for the book outside of... The already, you know, the skeptics audience who who already know you guys and already know kind of the material. Have you got hopes beyond that? Oh no. Yeah, I <laughs> absolutely not. I you know, in, yeah, yeah, in, and in an ideal world, like, would it be nice if if non skeptic or people who are not sort of like in in this world day to day read it? Sure. Uh, do I think that there's any real likelihood that that's going to happen? I I really I really don't. It, it's um. It's so hard to gain any kind of mainstream attention mm. um, to get in front of yeah. people and say, like, hey, if you're not interested in these topics, here's something anyway. I don't yeah. know how we would do that. We, we have heard, though, from a yeah. lot of people who've read the book. And, you know, so we're biased, right? You write the book and you're biased, so you don't really know. But a lot of people who've, who've read the book have said to us, this is a great book that I could hand off to somebody who might be a fence sitter. And they might be sitting yeah. on the fence and they might be your buddy who's not sure about QAnon. This might mm. be a good book to give them. Um, so that's the hope that I have for it is that it's not it's not so much just yeah. preaching to the choir, which is our show has always been. But our show has also been sort of subversive to belief in the past to other people that we want that we didn't know about. Right. So we'll get letters from ex-Mormons who say, I was a Mormon when I started listening to you, but you guys you guys changed me. And now I don't believe in that anymore. And that's happened with all different types of subjects. And I hope that the book itself That'd is something cool. like yeah. that, where, you know, it's not something that we we set out to do. But we think that a good sort of, you know, it's it's good collateral damage that it's able to do that sort of thing. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's lucky. Co there needs to be a word for like collateral improvement. Yeah, there you go. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we have a question here from Eagle who says, on a scale of meh to hell on earth, how hopeful are you guys for the future? Do Different. you think we're going to overcome all the bullshit? And if so, what do you think is going to help us? Okay, Igor, who do you want to hear, the optimist or the pessimist first? That's the question. You want to have that? I mean, <laughs> Igor is a regular and he's currently in Russia, so you can decide which of those two he needs right now. He wants to hear from Tom first. Oh, <laughs> yeah. God. I, 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 you know, it's funny because um, Cecil makes the optimist pessimist. I used to be the biggest optimist. I was crazy optimistic up until the last six or seven years. Um, and my, my, my views certainly have shifted. And they, I will admit, too, and I just want to be clear about it, that my, my views – may have unfairly concretized and I'm, I am challenging that within myself. So, um, but I am not real optimistic. I do think that the pace of technological change um, with web 2.0 has really weaponized bullshit um, and that there are state actors um, and big money actors who 
continue to leverage technology in ways that I don't think we are equipped at an individual level to try to um, counter. And I don't think that we will be able to. I think that um, things will continue to get worse, unfortunately, at a rapidly accelerating pace. <laughs> and I wish I didn't believe that. But I, I do. I think that that's more likely than not. Oh, I, however, am not a full optimist, but I'm also not a pessimist when it comes to this stuff. And the bright, shining thing that I look to is our reaction to COVID and what happened when it first hit and our ability as a as a human culture, not just as like I, a, a sort of political like United States culture, but like as a human culture to come together and make a vaccine in nine months mm. is so amazing. And I think the moment that the problems become so big that we cannot ignore them anymore or kick the can down the road, we have to get off our ass and fix them. We're pessimists at heart. Like humanity is pessimistic, uh, not pessimist, uh, per, what's that word? Uh, the, the kick the can down the road person. Uh, p- p- procrastinator. Procrastinator. Yeah. It started yeah, with yeah. a P. I knew it started with a P. So procrastinators at heart. So we're procrastinators. We try to kick the can down the road and try to get what we can now. And I think the moment something really big happens to where our information ecosystem is really at de- in, in vast jeopardy and danger, there might be some serious things that happen to try to change that. And smart people will come together and help us fix it. And I think that that's true. And I think that might, that might that's what I hang my hat on. Mm. So I think that's what I look to is like, I know we can come together and fix shit. I know we can do it. We just need to recognize that the shit needs to get fixed sooner rather than later. And that's a hard thing to do. I love Cecil that your optimism is, is like, it's still so tempered. It's like, I believe we will pull the parachute cord at the last possible second, <laughs> but we will pull it. And I'm like, it's all anvils, man. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. all anvils in there now, baby. <laughs> but that's the issue though, isn't it? Cause like when it comes to the vaccine, um, we, we weren't, we were, we were in the more moment of crisis, but we weren't too late for the crisis. Cause as soon as you create a vaccine, it's the right time to have a vaccine. You know, you, you, you the vaccine's yeah, good as soon right. as you get it. When it comes to something where the the effects only start to kick in once things have gone too far, something like climate change or even kind of, yeah, yeah. in some ways, I guess, the, the infodemic that we have, the idea that uh, our entire information ecosystem is broken, we might notice that it's broken. Um, by the time we notice that it's broken, we may only be able to fix so much of it because the damage is done. And, and how much of that genie is out the bottle that we can go away and solve some of the social media problems now, but that doesn't stop people having... Uh, been radicalized to a position that's so hard to get them back from. Um, and I, I was thinking about this just from what, what Tom was saying about the you know, s- bad actors who are weaponizing this stuff. The, the QAnon conference that I was at on the weekend in Birmingham, so in the middle of the UK, was had speakers there who were casually bringing up that Ukraine was actually all filled with Nazis and Russia was just doing what the West wouldn't and was just no. sharing yeah. an entire talk of Russian propaganda for war apologies. Um, we've seen the same thing through the anti-vax movement who pivoted to Russian Russian positions on the war so quickly because all the stuff they were getting on vaccines was already coming from Russia, that the problem was there. But by the time we knew about it, the damage had been done. So is that going to be an issue? You know, is, is, how do we, how do we get past that issue when some of the stuff that we notice may be too late to fix? I feel like both of you are ganging up on me right now. <laughs> I know. I, and I do not feel like this is a safe, safe space, space. <laughs> to express my ideas. So I am going to hold up my yellow card <laughs> so that you don't ask me any more questions. No, nah, man. I, I mean, no, I, I 100% get it. I get it. And I, I recognize that. And there has to be a part of me that remains hopeful. But I can't answer your question because I think, like, you're right. I think you're right. <laughs> but I also think, like, Like there's always these unknown factors that can always slip in and make us change our minds quickly. And I think those things exist and I've seen it happen in my lifetime. So I don't want to just be 100 percent. Let's close the book on this and say it was great humanity and we're done. But I think like, you know, there is there are some I don't know. I mean, I feel like I feel like there is some hope and I just don't want to let go of it. Maybe it's childish, but I just don't want to let go of it. I, I I would add to that because I've been a I've been an optimist my whole life until recently and it's difficult, and so I agree with Cecil. I think that I think this pandemic has done two contradictory things at the same moment. It has shown us that we can do great things, unbelievable, amazing, technologically unfeasible things, 
um, and that we can we can do them in just with speeds that are are unreal to think about. And then the same pandemic has shown me that despite being able to build the answer, rolling out the solution faces such tremendous difficulties. Mm. So I I I retain in my in this sort of like in the emotional part of me that needs to wake up and go to work and take care of my kids, I am hopeful. But that same part of me also, and and without hyperbole or exaggeration, I am very open and honest that I tell my kids, don't have more kids. I don't think that a generation after you is going to have a life that will be certain to be worth living in. And so I think I can probably hope that my kids will be all right-ish, but I certainly am fairly aggressive in telling the kids like, I wouldn't add one to the equation right now, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I'm real open with yeah. my teenagers. That's pretty about dark. That. That's pretty it dark. Is. Yeah. That's pretty but I, I, I'm, I'm way more positive than that. I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic, yeah. but my optimism comes from the most, most of the misinformation that I've seen. And most of the people who are drawn to misinformation that, that circulates on, on social media currently seem to be of generations mine and above. The younger generation seems to be because they're native to social media, they're more savvy to what's uh, what what doesn't pass the sniff test. And I think yeah. maybe that if you if you grow up with the technology, you're more aware of its uh, its flaws and damages than if that te technology comes in while you're already an established adult and have a, a worldview. So maybe the next generation will be the ones to save us. I'll just yeah. I'll, I'm pinning it all on your kids, basically, Tom. Your kids have got a lot of heavy. No, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I realize it's 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 funny too. Like just at a, at a personal level, like my wife and I talk about you know we we you, you make all these financial plans for retirement. We had we had talked for a while about oh, I'd like to move out to the west, and I'm like, no, absolutely not. There won't be any water left. Like we're not going to solve the climate issues. I just mm. don't know that we will. And so that's a big part of the driver when I think about those issues. Like yeah, I tell my kids I you know. I, I think that you guys will live a life where you won't be able to shower every day if you want to. I think we'll be, we'll be running out of water, stay near the Great Lakes. Like I'm like I'm like fairly You're kind of prepper. I'm kind of prepper about yeah. it. Yeah, I really am because I do think that our natural resources everything tells me our natural resources are in decline. Like I can't read anything that tells me otherwise and so I'm like all right, well, I, they were right about all the rest of that shit, so they're probably right about this. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You know, so it's tough. It's that's tough, and I know that message is fairly dark. So we should answer a happier question. Else. I was gonna say let's let's have a change of pace. We've got a yeah. question here from uh, from Nick G, uh, who asks, uh, "What's your favorite theory from the book? Either as the most bizarre or the one that you still think about the most?" Oh. Cecil, do you have a favorite? Uh, I don't know. So, my I will say one of the ones that I. I cherish is the ghost hunter yeah, paranormal yeah. stuff where people walk into a dark room and yell at it for a half an hour. <laughs> That's my favorite shit. I love that stuff so much where they're like, or they'll like, like clearly there's someone doing stuff around the, the haunted house they're in and they're like banging is something. And then all the guys have to spin around and be like, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> it's 40 minutes of people spinning their head and it's, it's, it's good TV. It's genuinely good TV and it's funny TV. Um, but I, the worst part is, is that people pass it off as like, like true TV, which it's right. not, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a bunch of guys at a scary spot that are freaking each other out or some producers making a loud bang noise or something. It's, it's, it's all bullshit. And, uh, but I will say too, also on that note, there is a, they have done this thing nowadays with these modern ghost shows and TV where they will do this. Uh, they'll come in with a bunch of things that they want to test and they'll test them. And I'm doing this very loosely with quotes here. They'll test them and then they will for four or five of them debunk them as if they're all like their, 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 their process is super rigorous, but mm. they're just, they're just finding things that are really absurd and getting rid of those and then not really digging deep in anything else. But they're making it. They're giving themselves the veneer of some sort of scientific inquiry. And that's super hurtful. But uh, but they are very funny to see a grown man scream in a room. I genuinely love that. <laughs> I think I think like like the non-serious answer, like, what do I think about? I think about a bunch of shit that's serious. So like the non-serious answer, my favorite silly one is Reiki. Oh, Reiki. Because Reiki is paying someone to play I'm not touching you. Oh, it's the best. That's what it is. It's the best. Mm. I'm not touching you. And then after 50 minutes of somebody not touching you, you give them money. Yeah. Like, 
I, I, I went through all of high school with nobody touching me, and it didn't cost me a dime. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I once got what? Reiki at, uh, at a mind-body Did you body really? Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the thing is, I, I was doing a, a, an investigation into just uh, a particular place in the southwest of, uh, of the UK. Was it Reiki? <laughs> it, well, it was, it was, it was, uh, I got free Reiki because I was just at this kind of mind, body, spirit, um, kind of, sure. you know, clinic yeah, type yeah, thing. Yeah, and I was yeah. just interested in picking up the leaflets, seeing what they were on offer. And this really nice man came up to him and was like, what are you interested in? He said, oh, you know, I'm interested in Reiki, but I'm, I'm not sure when you're doing the hands thing, can you feel anything? And he said, do you want a, a demonstration of it for free? I've got like half an hour before my next client. I was like, wow. yeah, yeah, all right then. Yeah, so he sits sure. me on this stool and I sit and I wasn't really careful about how my, my posture was. So I sat slightly awkwardly on the stool and then I thought, fuck, I'm not going to be able to move for half an hour because if I do, he's going to like touch me. So I've, I've got to stay still for half an hour. And he did half an hour of Reiki. And, and by the end, he's like, there, can you feel that? You should be able to feel it on your back. I was like, yeah, I haven't moved for half an hour. My back is killing me. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I can feel that. Yeah, I can really feel <laughs> I got raked into that an injury. Amazing. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, that's that is that is uh, that is perfect. That is just he, great. He raked you into a subluxation. Yeah. You yeah, yeah, go to the chiropractor <laughs> afterwards. And drink some <laughs> holy water or homeopathy water yeah. or whatever. When it comes I, to dangerous ones though, like I think Tom and I both are like the ones that cause the insurrection in the yeah, United conspiracy. States are probably yeah, the ones right. the most dangerous. Yeah, nowadays. Absolutely. But hilariously, we're the funniest ones 10 years ago. Yes. We're the ones that had yes. no chance of anything happening about. But nowadays, there's 200 people waiting for John John to reappear in Dallas because they think that he's going to come back. Yeah. And it's just insane. So, like, mm. what we thought back then changed our mind. I mean, we, we would, you would, if you would have asked me this 10 years ago, I would have I would have almost certainly said religion as the most dangerous. Yeah, one. same. Um, yeah. And now I think conspiracy has beaten it out. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Although on that, I will come to other questions from uh, from the views in a moment. But on that, when it comes to religion being the most dangerous one, it does make me think when you see abortion rights being pushed back in the U.S. Yeah, when yeah. you see, when you go along to a yep. QAnon conference and they're all talking about how this is the struggle between God and Satan, it's the you know the 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 existential struggle for the for the genuine soul for the literal souls. Yeah, um, it's, it's like interesting there's a how grand like there's a grand unified, unified theory. theory. <laughs> it's that, crazy. It's huh. weird. Oh look at that. Something what? Like that. Something like what? That. <laughs> okay, we've got, we've got another question here from Grady. We Earthling. did not even pay for that endorsement. <laughs> we did pay for the forward, but not that particular endorsement. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Uh, okay, we've got a question here from Gray the Earthling who asks, um, how can we counter unfalsifiable, unfalsifiable beliefs, like the idea that ghosts exist, and beliefs that are easy to reconcile with reality despite being false, like bisexual people don't exist? I think so some the, people you're just not able to talk to. Like there's some people that you just can't, you can't uh, get these ideas across. You could introduce them to a bisexual person and they just will be like, yeah, but you're confused or whatever. And they'll just pretend that they yeah. don't exist. So I think there's just, there's going to be some people that you just can never reach. And I think that those people just, I, 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 I don't think anything we say in the book is to say that certain that everybody's reachable or that you know that there's that this is a way to reach everyone because i don't think it is um so i i would never want to be on on the hook to try to answer this question because i i don't think we even really address how to how to reach somebody who's so you know so off of reality that you mm -hmm. have to like explain reality to them yeah i i this is this is tough and there's two questions in there and i don't know that i have a good answer for either to be honest but what, what I would come back to is if there was something that was going to work, it would really come back to asking someone to really articulate their thought process as to how they arrive yeah. at their conclusion. Socratic method, right? Right, yeah, yeah th that, that street epistemology, Socratic method notion. So if somebody's going to allow somebody to own the claim that they're making first, mm. right? So if the claim that they're making is that bisexual people aren't real or ghosts exist, acknowledge that that's their claim and then begin from the ground to ask them to articulate all the way forward to the end point of their claim. And I, I do think that if we're going to get anywhere, that's probably yeah, the best method that you can use. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's true. I think it's also worth trying to get as close as you can as to, to the reasons why people hold a belief. And that might yeah. not be the evidence that they bring forward or the, right. you know, the right. reasons that they use to persuade you. 
you know, if somebody sure. has a, a belief, especially when it comes to, you know, the talk about term sexuality and uh, and gender, things like that, people will hold one position that they'll believe is evidence based, but they'll hold it because of something in their person, it's something in their yes. life, something in their in their yeah. mindset, in their 100%. worldview first. Um, so trying to get at that can help you kind of get yes, a bit further into sure. it, I think. Um, let's see. We have a question here from uh, I'm going to go to the, the question from Jonathan, um, who asks, have you found that it's easier to convince someone that their belief is bullshit when they know you compared to when they don't? And is is trust important in, in that? I, I I have like a gut feeling answer to that, but I, I got to admit, I don't have any real personal experience with that. I, I don't have. God, this is such a fucking privileged thing to say. I don't have people in my life that hold a lot of bullshit ideas. Um, and I'm, I'm, and that's because I have a very, 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 very small family. Um, so it's just my dad and my brother and that's my entire family. I don't have an extended family mm. and my dad and my brother and I, we don't like just by virtue of how our family structure, we don't talk about religion, politics, or money. We never have. We probably never will. So I don't know what my family believes and my friends, I don't have friends that have a lot of crazy bullshit ideas. You know, it's just not how our, my, my friendships developed, I think like in lockstep, in lockstep with sort of these is, yeah. ideas. Yeah. So I, I'm just so fucking lucky. I would say like my gut says it would be easier if I had a personal connection. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I want to talk about this in a different way. I want to sort of approach it in a different way. We had a conversation with someone recently where we were talking about how we had never seen, Tom or I had never seen someone on a debate stage change of their heart. Right? Yeah, They've yeah, never yeah. had a change of heart. Mm. And then while we were talking about this, we all sort of realized, well, it's not about the people on the debate stage having a change of heart. It's the passive audience who's not really part of it, who can approach this in a safe way and approach these ideas and uh, opposition to ideas in a very safe way that might change their mind. So I don't know that trust really is the thing that makes a lot of people change their mind. I think it's them being able to feel safe around their ideas, maybe contend with them on their own or with other types of material that they choose to let in. And then maybe they change their mind that way. But I have people in my life that are very adamant about a lot of things that I very vehemently disagree with and also know aren't reality. And I don't have any luck talking to those people at all. Um, I don't, I, and, I, and in fact, several of the times, I just wind up not talking about anything. I talk about, I talk about the, the most basic of the weather or the sports or the whatever to try to yeah. not encounter those situations because they're uncomfortable and because they get very frustrated and very upset. And so I don't, I try to stay away from those topics to be perfectly frank. Um, but I think that people need, if, in order to change your mind, you've got to feel comfortable around that stuff. And that's what helped me change my mind. I was a Christian. I was a conservative. I was all the, all the stuff that I am not now. I was, and I changed my mind about it. I was a conspiracy theorist. I was up all that stuff, but I you were all the C all words, essentially. You I were was a Christian, all the C, <laughs> conservative, conspiracy theorist. I'm a giant theorist. C word. Yeah. I'm a giant C word. <laughs> Uh, Tom, you mentioned about how you don't have uh, how your friends uh, friendships developed in lockstep with this kind of uh, this worldview. And that, that brings to a question from um, a user called as an Android who asks, um, how did you guys meet? We, we met in college. Um, yeah. We met there, there was a sort of a loose knit kind of philosophy club. Yeah. Um, and um, Cecil and I both gravitate gravitated toward it. And it was it was not scientific, but it was. Um, dialectically argumentative, I yeah, guess would be the way I would. Yeah, yeah. I, um, and I thought it was really exciting. I thought that club was me too. As somebody just fresh out of high school and you'll yeah. see a different I was experience older at the time, but I was, I, I was my first real intellectual rigorous experience and I enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah. Mm. I loved it. And we didn't get along at first. We, so, yeah. we kind of hated each other. Yeah. When we first met, um, we met at this club and we kind of were around each other in two different groups of friends that sort of hung out. And uh, we actually had some close friends that were close friends too, but neither of us really hung out very much. And then we ran into each other in the streets of Chicago. He was going to school and I was going to school. And I just reached out to him and said, hey, we should hang out sometime. And he <laughs> said, sure. And then the second thing we did together was we read The Metaphysics of Morals by Kant together. We did. And so, and so we, we, read a, we read a book. It's your we, classic was, bromance you know, just, story. Just, yeah. <laughs> and then after that, after that, well, after that, Tom stood up at my wedding eight months yeah. later. So we became very close friends after after uh, 
after he showed me his cont. <laughs> <laughs> it all went downhill from there. <laughs> that is uh, so funny that that's, I know that's the first book like, we read together. Hey, uh, yeah. we barely know each other, you barely know, like each other. Let's read. Another thing that's hilarious too is before <laughs> we started a podcast, Tom and I thought we really what we really wanted to do is sort of like find stuff that we could really talk about deeply about because Tom and I have always had really yeah. good deep conversations. Hmm. And one of the things that we struck on was why don't we read? A, like the yeah. best <laughs> works of literature. Let's find a, a thing that's like the best works of literature. And so Tom and I looked at it and oh we, my flipped a, we flipped a coin or rolled a die or whatever, whatever we, did we did to did. pick off this top 50. And we chose <laughs> uh, Sound and Fury by Faulkner. Oh, okay. And it's the most inscrutable garbage book <laughs> I've ever read in my entire life. Literally And horrible. Tom and I, like, we, we read that book together. We looked at each other, and then we quit reading books together. <laughs> <laughs> we, abandoned we abandoned that abandoned. ship. And then we started a podcast. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so there you go. So that's how the podcast was born. We, read, we, we noped the fuck out of uh, Sound and Fury. Yep. And so that's why there's a podcast. I wonder if we had read something better. If I know, we, right? If it we might had... not ever been anything else. That's so we, we owe this yeah. to Faulkner. We owe it to Faulkner. <laughs> Should have been a dedication at the front of the book. Two fold. Yeah. This book wouldn't exist without your yeah. garbage. Uh, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> cognitive dissonance. It's all sound and fury oh, signifying man. nothing. I know and, I, and, I, and before anybody tells me I'm not smart enough for that book, I know I read yes. it. Okay, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, okay, we've got an uh, anonymous question who's just asking, uh, what are the pictures behind you? I think I can see Ruth Bader Ginsburg oh, yeah. behind Tom. Who's yeah. that behind Cecil? This is Margaret Sanger. So, yeah, so just gotcha. based on based the on current state, current state of, of affairs. affairs in the United States. <laughs> now, they are covering up right now. They're, they're sort of covering up Marky Mark photos that were given to us by Eli. But <laughs> we, we decided recently, since we're doing a lot more live streaming, that we're going to change the pictures out on occasion. But we just haven't changed them out since the... The, the row last week, and we don't think we will for a while. We think they're going to stay for a bit. We'll change when reasonable. women are people again. Yeah. When yeah, when people yeah, when women become so, people, we'll change them. They'll be dust they'll covered. Never, they'll never change. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got another anonymous question who asks, um, "What do you think helps people avoid the radical, uh, sorry, the rational, logical douchebag skepticism phase, which lords of us go through? I went through it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We all we all kind of go through it, but it can put other people off hearing us. And how do we encourage ourselves and each other to be better?" Man, how do you, it's, 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 it, this is about the answer. The end result is about empathy. Yeah. But the, the, the process, that is a tough question. Yeah. I don't have a quick answer I, for, I, I don't know. Either. Yeah. I, I, I hate that, but I don't know. I know that we've got to get to a place of empathy, but I don't know how we, how we systematize that or teach that. Yeah. And I think, I think it's also, you know, one of the things you've always got to do is try to remain humble in your own beliefs. Yeah. And, you know, the difficulty is, is that the things that you're looking at and the things that you're figuring out, whether or not there's a God or whether or not Reiki's real, that shit's easy. It I mean, is it's so easy. easy. You're not, you're not Brainiac. You're not this giant, you're not this genius. You're just a person, just like everybody else. And you have your flaws and other people have flaws. And sometimes those people get tricked. And you know what? I've been tricked in my life and other people have been tricked. And I think it's just sort of recognizing and coming to your own humility, understanding that you are just as susceptible to being tricked as other people are. Um, you know, that's, I think, the I just got to be open to that. And that's a hard thing to get past, especially when you figure yeah. out an easy answer to something. And so, but, but growth is tough. Growth is difficult and it's, yeah. and it takes a while. It's not fast. Yeah. It's not a quick thing. I, I think I see. So I think you, I think in the vein of the book, in the vein of, of the same kind of be wary of smugness. Yeah. So the more, the more you enjoy a feeling of smugness or superiority, um, that should be a red flag for you, for you. as a person. Yeah. And I think if we can take that as a tack, yeah. that might help us to veer toward empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to do that. Hold on. I want to do this question, Marsh. Okay. <laughs> who, who was the best cog disc guest and why was it Marsh? So that's the question <laughs> I want to cover. I mean, I was very, very deliberately skipping over them, but for fine, I know we'll do you that were. one. Well, well, we know you wrote it, so we want to talk to you about it. We want I'm just to remind it. you that this is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you go for it, guys. <laughs> Who's the best cog disc guest? Uh, you know, we've had some really great guests on, and of course we love Marsh. Marsh has come back for um, like almost all our hundred shows. We've had Marsh on. When we talk about our favorite guests, 
we suggest going back to our 100 shows because whenever we do a 100 show, we treat ourselves and we invite the people we love in skepticism the most. And so Marsh is on. Well, he was skeptic puzzle, of the year, the if I remember. <laughs> <laughs> of the year. There's not even a website, I think, somewhere. Yeah, which you, <laughs> which you, pick yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> the puzzle and the thunderstorm guys, Eli, Noah, and Heath. We do another podcast with them, but we love those guys too. Thomas Smith, the Knowledge Fight guys. Um, Geo, I still remember you know, loving talking to Jake Far Wharton. Jake Far Wharton from back in the awesome day. Awesome guy. People we had a really close connection to. But I will say this: some uh, so we've had some really good interviews, and I will point you to a couple weeks ago. If you're if you're if this is the first time you're encountering us, and you're interested in finding out about abortion in America, we had an abortion doctor on a couple maybe maybe three four she was weeks great. ago, and she was great. Her name was Jessica. She she's in Texas, and we talked to her for a while. So sometimes we do we we stumble upon a really great interview that is like somebody who is like deep in the field and we did this with a couple of different people but um but our favorite guests are almost certainly the people we have on our hundred shows because those are the people we ask back all the time because we just enjoy their company yeah and we when we have our hundred shows that oftentimes you do a hundred shows a hundred two hundred three so that oftentimes will coincide with a new incredulous drop. yeah right like so then you gotta you gotta remember andy will wilson right around there yeah. we'll have andy on to talk about it so. <laughs> God, poor andy wilson he's just sat <laughs> i love him absolutely, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> we love you andy we uh, love you, it's andy. big love. All right. we love we've got an anonymous question here um you talk a lot about right-wing bullshit and that's something you focus a lot on on the show sure. what's the worst politically left-wing bullshit that isn't just you know goop style Woo alternative medicine, which which I'm not even sure that's necessarily still left these days. Anti-vaxxers sp like yeah. sp spawned from the left wing. Like that's where it came yeah. from. It came from like the anti-vax push when we first started talking that about was a it, left wing it was thing. a mm. left wing push. Yep. And it was something that we were highly critical of back then. And it's a terrible thing. And it's something that that we think, you know, is is probably one of the worst most egregious things that we've done is spit in the face of vaccines is such a horrible, stupid thing that our culture has done. And that initially came. Now, don't get me wrong. The COVID stuff, like all that COVID stuff that came out, that anti-COVID vaccine, that initially was, I think maybe there was some left and right sort of coalescing together, but that became a more right-wing issue after the vaccines were released than it was mm -hmm. a left-wing. I'm sure there's plenty of left-wing people who haven't done it, but they, they, are, they are dwarfed in our country by the right-wing. Yeah, if if I it's it's tough because I I want to be fair, but this is not in and I and I I will I will raise my hand and recognize my politics because the question specifically refers to the politics too. So my politics lean fairly sharply left. So it's tough. And so my politics lean left in the UK that would be probably center right. Center right. You know. <laughs> so you know it's it I I am much more sympathetic to left wing ideas and ideals than I am to center or right ideals. So I'll, I'll yeah, admit my right. bias yeah, there we're biased for sure. and just say, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's tougher for me on the political side. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I, nothing, I, honestly, I know that's, it's, it's probably going to sound like bullshit, but nothing jumps to mind in that way on the politics side that, that has the same egregious anti-intellectualist yeah, nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure there are plenty of, of positions that on a very micro level that I would point at and say that's nonsense, or I think that's poorly reasoned. Um, but the anti-intellectualism that pervades the right, um, I find just so distressing. Yeah, it, it's tricky to 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 answer a question like that, I guess, when so much of the right wing in, in certainly your country and, and parts of uh, parts of this country, too, have embraced that conspiracy theory style. So yes. that it's that conspiracy is almost inherently right wing by this point. And, and, and I know that when it comes to COVID vaccines, for example, they may have started out being distrusted equally uh, by a percentage of both the, the particular left and right and, and central. But what I've witnessed from having spent a lot, a lot of time around anti-vaxxers is the more time you spend as an anti-vaxxer, the further right wing you get, because there's a yeah. lot of right wing groups who recognize anti-vaxxers as a fertile fishing ground for recruitment. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll and, start to drip through that stuff in. Yeah, and just look at the numbers as to who took the vaccine yeah. and what their political right, leanings right. are. Like, if you want to cut through all the bullshit, like, look who got a jab and who didn't. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's fairly 
heavily weighted in one direction rather than the other. Also, look at the people who got a jab that were uh, that were in danger, right? We were talking right, about yeah, the, we old, talked. the elder the, the older crowd, maybe conservative, but they were also they all got the jab. A lot of them recognized that they were yeah. the ones that were very deeply in danger, and so they they might have gone against their political leanings in that case, which is mm. an interesting point too. Yeah. I don't know what it means, but it's just an interesting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put your self preservation above your politics sometimes, right? Sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes. all yeah. of a, all of a sudden, my <laughs> ideals are a little more flexible if yeah. I think. Yeah. I'm going to die. Yeah. 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 Um, we got another honest question uh, here, which is, um, do you think that skepticism and demanding proof will become an evolutionary pressure for ideas? So, for example, will QAnon oh. eventually die off naturally because it's less competitive because it can't compete in that area? So I wish it was less competitive. Yeah. I don't I I guess like the premise presumes that there is a selective pressure on ideas yeah. that favors true ideas over less true ideas, and I don't see evidence that that's true. I wish that it was. I actually see evidence that um, the opposite, the opposite yeah. is true, that, mm. that uh, ideas which are more emotionally evocative outperform ideas which are less emotionally evocative. And I think the, the evidence of social media companies purposefully recognizing yeah. that reality and, and that. then weighting the algorithm based on angry or sad versus just a like or a heart um, demonstrates yeah. that that reality. Unfortunately, yeah. oh, I hate that that's true. But and, <laughs> well, and, and, and I think too, like like those, you're rewarded. You reward yourself for believing those things by you know you're emotionally invested in it because, for instance, with a conspiracy theory, you're the you're the investigator who's peeling back these layers of this onion, right? You're you're part of it. You're invested in that conspiracy theory. You're the one who's showing the world that this is the real thing. That you're you you are part of it, and you're not just part of it. You're you're the one who's revealing it to all the other people around you and to like this group of you know maybe Facebook friends or Twitter followers or whoever. And so there's a lot of feedback there that that reinforces your belief. And then I I, I think that that's hard to unplug someone yeah. from. So I think like that's why when we hear about QAnon, we hear about like these people that have to deprogram. They're like cult deprogrammers who have to talk to QAnon people for like in a one on one style. This can't mm. be done in a mass way. It has to be done one on one where they talk to them for a long time to get them to finally come out because it's like a it's like a cult. It feeds you like a cult. So yeah. it, it does it does it gives you all the stuff you need to keep believing it. So I I am I'm also very pessimistic about that as well. Yikes! Yeah. This is a great talk though. I mean I really great. <laughs> ah, great. No, but I think it's uh, true. I, mean, I think these bad yeah. ideas, it's like when a ship sinks, you know, that you all sink together, but you get fished out one by one. And that's kind of how you end up getting yeah. into cults yeah. and, and yes. QAnon and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think I think that's uh, all the time we've got for questions. I think we've had uh, loads of really interesting questions there. I thank you guys so much for the time. Uh, just to remind people, the book is The Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit. It's available on Amazon, or you can buy the audio book directly from your website. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, dissonancepod.com. Yes. Excellent. And you can everybody can go there to find uh, Cognitive Dissonance for shows 629 onwards and all the ones before that, too. So thank you so much, Tom Cecil. It's been really uh, an absolute pleasure spending time with you this evening. Oh, thank you so much. You, Marsh, as always. Yep. And guys, so this is the end of Skeptics in the Pub online for this evening. But remember, we're going to be back in two weeks' time with a talk by Deborah Hyde. She's going to be talking about the life and death of Marguerite Jordemain, who's a, a person who was uh, executed for being a witch. That's going to be on May the 26th at uh, 7 p.m. UK time right here on Twitch. Or have a look out for your local Skeptics in the Pub. Lots of them are returning to the pubs, returning back to the wild, and you can actually meet people in person, face-to-face, -face, over a pint, which uh, I've been doing a little bit of so far and it's been an absolute delight so please bear that in mind too um whatever you're doing uh have fun stay safe and we will see you next time